Why is the brain fascinating? What drives your research? You know, I always, uh, as a child, I always ask the question why. So that was my first exposure to research. Okay. So, and uh, if I was uh, given something in a bowl, my mom always tells me that if I, uh, I was the least noisy child, never made any noise. And if I was given a bowl of, say, fruits or something, I just keep looking at it. Slowly, but just keep looking at it. And I always had this question why? Why? Yes. So uh, I got into research. I began my career with uh, research in cancer, uh, field of juvenile cancers. From there, I came to metallurgy. All these places I had the opportunity of doing PhD, but uh, somehow when I joined AIMS, I heard about Professor Shashi Varma was working on the effect of music on developing brain. That was the most fascinating uh, you know, subject that I came. No, it was the effect of music on developing brain. So in Indian mythology, we have all heard about uh, Abhimanyu. So normally we say that Abh Abhimanyu was uh, very learned. He was, for his age, he was very mature. So what is uh, the uh, what is the neural component of that kind of learning? So that was my first exposure to brain research. So she, when I went for the interview, she asked me, so uh, your background is in microbiology. I said, yes, ma'am, but I'm ready to learn. So she said, I'm ready to teach. So that was my first uh, exposure to science research. And uh, there on, so I, uh, so the, par the the project was like this, so we used to have these fertilized eggs which we used to keep in the incubator, keep them for 21 days and uh, we used to turn them, uh, initially it was a manual thing and then we had an automated uh, uh, incubator which, was, which used to tilt the eggs so that they fertilize and we used to play music to these uh, developing embryos. So and the music protocol was also different and there were two types of sounds. Music is one sound, the other sound was of um, maternal calls and the hatchling calls. So maternal call means that the mother's, uh, the mother hen, she incubates the egg and she makes those characteristic sounds like plop, 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 like that. So those are low frequency sounds. So those sounds were played in the early development. So there was some literature available which told that uh, the uh, auditory neurons, so now the neurons which process the uh, sounds are known as auditory neurons, right? So the auditory nuclei, you know, there are different levels of nuclei, the first order, second order, third order, fourth order, hence, and then it becomes to, uh, the cortex. So the second and the third order nuclei that we study, they develop in a particular pattern. So they are formed and then they migrate. They migrate to this uh, floor of the fourth ventricle and they uh, so migrate by, uh, they reach there by eight days. By tenth day, they are a little more mature. Then they start responding to sounds. Okay, so uh, what we did was, so we did, and they start responding to low frequency sounds. After uh, 16th day, 14th day, 10 to 14 days part, uh, they start responding to high frequency sounds. So, 16th day onwards, 10 to 14, 14 to 21, yes, 10 to 14, 14 uh, uh, 10 to 14 was a low frequency, 14 onwards was the high frequency sound. So, those high frequency sounds are the hatchling calls. So, chee, 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 like, like that. So, what we found was those egg uh, fertilized eggs, or the uh, chicks which hatched out of unstimulated uh, environment, had fewer neurons compared to those which were better stimulated. So, the uh, whether it was so, and similar protocol was followed for music. So, we had a low frequency music in the earlier stage and high frequency music in the following stage. So this was required because it is uh, it is a requirement of the neurons while they grow. You know, as the cochlea grows, the folds of the cochlea respond to uh, different folds, uh, different levels. They respond to different uh, decibels of sound. 
different uh, frequencies what of sound. What sort of music? Yes, so that was uh, Ravi Shankar's sitar music. So low frequency, high frequency, match, uh, maternal calls, uh, hatchling calls. So when we played them, they had more number of neurons, the uh, synaptic proteins were enhanced, the apoptosis was reduced, the transcription factors were better facilitated. So yes, so both second order nucleus as well as the third order. So these are uh, available on internet. You can see either Aladi Falguni or uh, Vadva Shashi. And uh, another colleague of mine did another study on uh, behavior. And what, they found, what we found was that uh, after this kind of music exposure and when they hatched out, uh, we exposed them to the same sounds once again. Right? So say in the normal around 7 out of 10 chicks uh, would respond to the maternal call. All the, uh, all the uh, chicks which had hatched out after listening to the music or the uh, maternal calls or hatchling calls, they all ran behind the mother. So they could actually recognize, recognize the sound. So this was not mother uh, as in the whole hen, but it was, you know, we, could, we would play the tape recorder behind a dummy or the say. So you're left in a maze where one side this, uh, one type of sound is played, the other side the other sound is played. And this way. So they, it facilitated their learning. And it lasted for some time. So three, four days. And then some other studies were on hippocampus higher order So this was my first exposure to neuroscience and then I decided, you know, I'd, till that time I'd hopped and uh, because of circumstances, it was not uh, that I wasn't interested and it was because of circumstances that I had to shift uh, the field of uh, study. And, uh, but this got me interested and then I said, no, I'm not moving away from neuroscience. Uh, Ma'am, we have one more question for you. Uh, what is that um, what is one of your most exciting experiences during your research career? Like something that you've come across that's made you so happy, something your most exciting research experience. Yes. So that again is something to do with the music research, and uh, that's how I got uh, more glued on to neuroscience. To neuroscience. Yes. So uh, the thing was, uh, they. Uh, so we were looking at uh, like uh, till I joined, there was another student. So she was looking at the. Um, post hatch day one, right? Uh, she was looking at those specimens, so effect of music, and then hatch them, and then look at the brains. But then I thought that there should be something which is how is it that at hatching you see there are so many differences. So that means there is something which is going on in in the preceding stages, yes. right? So uh, my uh, proposal was not very much appreciated by some other people, but my guide said, okay, let's go. On. And uh, the synaptic proteins and all, you know, we had seen some kind of changes. But when I saw the embryonic period, the E8 and E10 and E12, and uh, I, I looked at the entire embryonic period, and I saw the synaptic pruning in terms of differential expression of synaptic proteins. So, the, uh, so I'm talking about the second and the third order nucleus, right? The second order nucleus sends it to uh, processes to the third order nucleus, right? So all the terminals end into the third order nucleus and it forms a neuropil. That is a nucleus laminaris. It has a thick neuropil. So what we found was at eight days, we had this nice bushy neurons, a lot of synaptic proteins in the, uh, in the uh, cell, around the cell bodies. Then we started seeing the cell processes. Then we saw it had reached the neuropil. Okay, so we knew that the basis of this enrichment was in embryonic uh, development itself. So that was very exciting. Then what the other thing which we saw was that uh, transcription factors. <laughs> we found that transcription factors were expressed in the cytoplasm, whereas they had nuclear uh, localization. They were supposed to be localized in the nucleus. But then we realized that uh, then there was, around the same time, there was a paper by Crino which said that uh, when there is active and, uh, metabolism and active synaptic uh, transmission taking place, the whole transcriptional machinery is transported to the nerve terminals. 
So initially we thought, wow, what is the transcription factor doing in the cell? It's supposed to be, so we thought it's mislabeled, we tried everything, we tried phosphorylated uh, C-gen also. And the phosphorylated C-gen was also located in the nerve terminals. And that was what we saw with confocal microscopy. So we knew that we are right. I mean, everything is fine. But then around the same time, there was this PNAS paper which said that uh, the whole active transcription machine was there. So that was very exciting. And the second exciting state was uh, when we saw this uh, admixed population. They indeed had uh, more number of uh, nigral neurons and they did not die. So we were actually seeing the replica of the Anglo-Indians in the animal models. So that was really exciting. Mom, if you would say, if you would explain brain in just one sentence, what would you say about brain? Brain in one sentence? I think it's uh, brain is the dual, keep all, protector. Wow, man. <laughs> that's one, its basic. Uh, that's its basic function, and uh, to a large extent, it helps us. You know, till all the way you age till 60 or 70 years, most of the things don't go wrong. It's only when we ki kind of attack it through different. Uh, Vices that it starts misbehaving. And one last quick question. Yeah. Uh, what, according to you, is that one area of brain research that deserves the attention that it's not it's not getting right now? Developmental disorders. Development, like or uh, or like psychiatric disorders. Or psychiatric disorders are being studied. Oh. Okay. Lots of uh, see. But see, even in neurodegenerative disorders, most important thing is drug development. Yes. You're not having. So the idea is you have to have uh, like. Uh, individualized medicine, individualized uh, treatment for people where all these basic uh, things will come into picture. Like what is the basic susceptibility of the person? Are the populations medicine. different? Personalized medicine. Are the people different? So what applies to Caucasians may not apply to us. So these are two intriguing things which, uh, which should keep be. me engaged. Thank you so much for this. My pleasure. God bless you.